I would recommend you talk to an attorney about how to respond to that letter. And then you're going to have more correspondence probably after the demand letter. Respond to those. What also happens, too, is there are firms out there and uh, organizations that buy or get the list pendants list, the list of potential foreclosures. You will get letters from people that have nothing to do with your best interests, but have a lot to do with lining their own pockets. There's a lot of scams out there. Be careful. Uh, you know, Michael talked about it, everybody's going to talk about it. There are websites that sound an awful lot like government websites. There are letters that are come out that look an awful lot like official correspondence. Be careful. Make sure, vet those letters. Don't just respond to one and all of a sudden somebody's going to be lifting $500 a week out of your pocket because they're going to protect your house. Don't sign up for the scam. Be careful. Check these things out. Um, and then the two biggest things in this slide are don't do nothing. Don't sit there and bury your head in the sand. Things aren't going to get better if you ignore them. And don't ignore the context. The next slide is, uh, and the next section is on asset protection, and Mr. Larson's going to speak about that. We do a great deal of trial work. And one of the issues that many of the clients that come to see us have is in regard to what is protected under Florida law and what is not protected under Florida law. Now, if you're a teacher, a fireman, or a law enforcement officer, there's great news. Your pensions are protected. No ifs, sends or buts. I don't care who the creditor is, there is no way they're going to get your pension. If you have a 401k, a defined benefit plan, or another ERISA qualified retirement plan, you're also safe because under Florida, as well as federal law, those pension plans are exempt from claims of creditors. Now, Florida, unlike many other states, have also extended these protections to IRAs. So if you have an IRA, whether it was inherited or whether or not it was a rollover or if you funded it yourself, that is also protected as well as annuities and cash value of life insurance policies. That's the good news. The bad news is if you're receiving income and it's not veterans benefits, social security, or disability, it can be subject to garnishment. If you receive wages and you are a head of household, those wages are exempt as long as you don't sign a written waiver. So whatever happens, don't sign a waiver saying they can garnish your wages. Where do these waivers appear? In promissory notes, in mortgages, and in personal guarantees. So be careful. Now, one of the biggest protections that Florida residents, and you have to be a Floridian to have this protection, is the homestead exemption. Under Article 10, Section 4 of the Florida Constitution, you have the right to exempt from your claims of creditors an unlimited amount of equity in your home. Well, it's nice if you have equity in your home. Many people don't. But if you're in this state for longer than two years, it's unlimited. Unlike New Jersey, which does not recognize homestead exemptions. Unlike New York, which has a cap of $10,000. A state like Nevada, I believe, is in excess of 500000 But it doesn't matter if you've got $10 million of equity in your house. It's exempt from claims of creditors. So what do we take away from this? Don't give anybody a mortgage on your house needlessly. And don't take money out of your retirement plans to pay general creditors like credit card debt or investment mortgages. And that's one of the ways you can protect yourself. In regard to garnishment, if you're receiving Social Security, make sure those Social Security monies go into a separate account so they're not commingled. If your creditor sees that it's Social Security monies, they cannot, by law, federal and state, attach those monies. Same with disability. Same with veterans' benefits. And there are other um, asset classes and income streams which are also protected, such as child support and alimony, but to a limited extent. Now, 
what happens should your creditors get a judgment? What can they do? Well, they can garnish your accounts. If you have a debt that's only in your name and not your spouse's name, you have an asset exemption called tenancy by the entirety. It's not available if both husband and wife incurred the debt, such as they would have on a promissory note and a mortgage. If you have a vehicle, and that vehicle is titled husband and wife, it's also protected by the tenancy by the entirety doctrine. But if it's titled husband or wife, then it's not. And the, and the creditors of your husband can attach the wife's property. In addition, that same Article 10, Section 4, which gives you an unlimited exemption in your homestead, only gives you $1,000 in personal property exemption. So any assets that you have which aren't protected by some other provision, such as Social Security or wages, is available to your creditor. So if you have antiques, sports memorabilia, a boat, your creditors can attach those assets if they're in your name and you've incurred the debt. Under Florida Statute 222 and its 26 subparts, should you not take an exemption for a homestead, they give you a whopping $4,000 called a wild card exemption. So now you're up to $5,000. And a $1,000 equity exemption in a motor vehicle. Most people have a lot more equity in their motor vehicles. Most people's property exceeds $4,000 plus to $1,000 plus to $1,000 for the automobile. So what can you exempt? Your homestead, your pension, your wages. And if you don't take the homestead, a maximum of $6,000 in personal property. So when you decide to see an attorney, what you're seeking to do in regard to assets protection is to make sure most of your assets fall within one of those protected classes. If not, then you need to make sure that you maximize your protections under Florida law. Now, in regard to credit, many people believe that they can maintain a high credit score in light or even though they've had some adverse financial circumstances. That's not the way the system works. Most of the credit reporting agencies, the three major credit reporting agencies, use a FICO score. And many people who have not defaulted have a score in excess of 700. Once they default, whether on a credit card, on a mortgage, or on some other debt, including medical bills, it plummets rather rapidly where it goes down below 620. Should that happen, your cost of buying credit is similar to that of Spain, Greece, Portugal, and Ireland. It significantly escalates. So for example, you see all these teaser rates out there of a mortgage for 3% or 4%. If you have a low credit score, you're looking at 7, 8, 9%. Your credit card rates are no longer at 9 or 10%, they're at 23, 25, 28%. If you have the ability to reestablish your credit over a period of time, 36 months is usually the benchmark, you can start to increase your credit rating. If you go above 620, but below 650, you're gonna be classified as well on your way to reestablishing your credit, which means instead of 25%, you may be 12% or 14%. If you get above 650, then the banks may lend to you, but they want a significant down payment and they want steady income. Michael, who spoke to you earlier, can do wonders with modifications. But if you don't have an income, there's very limited possibilities for him to work with because you have to be able to pay your bills going forward. And that's the way you rehabilitate your credit. Now, 
should you find yourself in a position where you're sued in foreclosure, have a short sale, or give the bank back a deed, your negative credit rating for that event is going to stay on your credit report for seven years. If you go into bankruptcy and you wipe out all this debt, you won't be able to file another Chapter 7 liquidation for eight years. And that stays on your credit report for 10 years. So even though you've wiped out all the debt, it stays on the credit report three years longer than if you went through the foreclosure. So there are significant aspects to this because should you find yourself in a position where you want to rehabilitate your credit and per possibly purchase another home or get on with your life, then you have to take into consideration what your borrowing cost will be. Now, in regard to homeowners associations and condo associations, the governing documents will determine what your obligations and your responsibilities are. The first document you need to look at is your declaration. This is the document that's filed when the when the association is first formed. That document is recorded on the county official records. The second document is the bylaws, which are the governing is the governing instrument which will tell you how the association is to operate. If it's not recorded, you have the right to go to the manager and say, I want to look at the minutes of the meetings and I want to look at the governing documents. Now, in regard to assessments, there are two types, typically, general and special. The general assessments are for maintaining the common areas. The special assessments are those that, that are imposed should the condominium need a new roof or the street needs to be repaired or there was hurricane damages. Now, if there are certain communities which may have four or five assessments. For example, there's one community in town that has a common area assessment, a general assessment for the reserves, a beach assessment, a mariner assessment, and a golf course assessment. And each one of those assessments are passed through to you, the owner, on either a monthly or quarterly basis. And they become quite significant. If you should find yourself in a dispute where the managers allege that you haven't paid your assessments, they will file a lien against your unit or your home. Now, should you contend that it was wrongfully done, I can tell you right now that your recourse against either the board of directors or the officers are quite limited. One of the things that the representatives in the House of, of, of Representatives for the state of Florida have done is pass legislation very protective of those board of directors and those officers because they recognize that they're typically volunteers. They're fellow homeowners. They're fellow unit owners. So the first provision, for example, for a liability of directors under Florida statute says, a director is not personally liable for monetary damages, and then there are exceptions, indicating that it will be very, very difficult unless that director or that officer did something that was fraudulent, took money, or did it because they didn't like you. But if they were acting in good faith, you're not going to have much of a recourse. And it's the same thing for the association directors as it is for the homeowners associations, whether it's a corporation or whether or not it's a limited liability company. Having said that, should you not pay that assessment and they assess by putting a lien against your property, there's two things that's going to happen. They're going to send you a notice to cure the default. Should you not do that, they're going to file a notice of claim. Then if you do not pay, they will move by filing a complaint 
to foreclose that lien. Just as if you didn't pay your mortgage on your home, they will foreclose down in the county courthouse. Should they get a judgment against your home and you, you will be personally liable just if they got a judgment for not paying credit cards or medical bills or not paying the promissory note for the money that you borrowed to buy the house. This means you won't be able to sell it. You'll also have your personal assets at risk and they can take title, dispossess you from your home and then go after your personal assets. Which brings us to foreclosure litigation. As I said before, Francesca, Mr. Neal and I do a lot of trial work and many clients come to us once they've been sued. Now it starts with, as Mr. Neal said, a notice of default to the borrower. That notice has to be to a proper address, which is contained in a mortgage or in the note. And that is required by the due process provisions of the federal constitution and the state constitution. That notice also accelerates the debt. So even though you're only $5,000 in arrears, they accelerate the debt and they come after you for the total of $300,000 outstanding on your mortgage. That's significant for purposes of further proceedings in the court. And they have five years from the date of your last payment to pursue that collection. Now, the way it starts is they'll file a summons and complaint, as well as a Liz pendings, which is a notice to the world that basically there's a lawsuit pending against that property or that affects that property. That summons will give you 20 days to come to court and file a response. The complaint will list principally two requests for relief. One is that the court order your house to be sold at auction. And the second is that an amount of money be determined that you owe to the bank. Now, you can respond to the complaint by moving to dismiss, saying it's a defect, or by filing an answer, saying I either admit I owe the money or I deny that I owe the money, or that I don't have enough information at this point to either admit or deny. And then you can file what's known as affirmative defenses, which say, I admit I owe the money, but the reason why I should not have to pay is this, either the statute of limitations has been exceeded, or there has been an offset, the, the person suing me actually owes me money and I want that offset, and there are many other affirmative defenses that we just can't get into right now. At that point, you're entitled to receive what's known as discovery, which means you can ask them questions and ask for documents from whomever is suing you. Pat Neal touched upon this, and this is pretty significant, the missing note issue. I agree with Pat. It doesn't matter if the note is missing, except under extraordinary circumstances, because what they're going to do is they're going to ask you to come to what's known as a deposition. They're going to put a copy of that promissory note and mortgage before you, and they're going to ask, is that your signature? Did you sign this saying you owe that money? Well, you have to tell the truth. You're under oath. If you say, yes, that is my signature, they're going to take that portion of the deposition. They're going to bring it down to one of our judges, whoever is assigned to the case, and a judge is going to say, OK, we'll allow you to reestablish that promissory note, as long as you can prove that you own that promissory note, Mr. Lender. So the missing note myth has not been successful in my experience. And, but it's created a lot of confusion out there among the borrowers. Now, having said all of that, at some point we're going to get to the point where the bank is going to move for what's known as summary judgment. That means that they're going to say, there is no question of fact. Judge, just give me my judgment so I can get these people out of that house. 
If you defeat the bank at summary judgment, you're going to go to trial, which means that basically there is a genuine issue of material fact. If there is no genuine issue of material fact, the judge is going to issue a judgment. In that judgment, it's going to say the borrower owes X number of dollars. This house is going to be sold to satisfy that debt. And this house will be sold on such and such a date. Wednesdays at 11 a.m. is when we sell the properties at foreclosure in the county clerk's office, which is really just in the annex of the courthouse. And they'll sell it at auction, and you'll have a bunch of people standing around who have investigated this property, determined whether or not it's a good buy for them, and they'll bid on the property. If they don't bid on that property, the lender will bid his judgment in, usually for $100, and they'll take title. Now, after the sale, the clerk's office will issue a certificate of sale to the buyer. Within 10 days, if no objection to the process used to sell the property is made, the clerk will issue a certificate of title. Well, it works differently in different counties. Here in Collier County, most of the time, the lender has to go back to the judge to get a writ of possession. In other counties, the writ of possession is issued with the certificate of title. So as you can see, our judges are, are very protective of the due process rights of the citizenry of this county and want to make sure that everybody has an obligation to appear before the court to contest this relief. But if you do not file a response to the complaint, a default will be entered against you and you're on the fast track to losing your home. So once the writ of possession is issued, the sheriff's office will come out and politely ask you to leave upon request of the new owner of the property. In some counties, they escort you out. Here in Collier County, we're a little bit more respectful and they usually give notice and ask the people to leave. Should the people not leave, then of course the Collier County Sheriff's Office has no alternative but to assist the lender in dispossessing you from the property. If this is an investment property and is not homestead, you're usually not accorded as much courtesy simply because you're not residing there with your family or you're not residing there yourself. All right. Now, we, we mentioned an issue before in regard to the sale, whether the bank buys it or an investor buys the property. If the bank buys the property, they have to go back to the court and establish fair market value at the time of the sale through an appraisal, an independent appraisal. If a third party bidder, an investor, buys the property at the sale, fair market value is determined by the amount paid by that part, third party bidder. Either way, the lender will go back sooner or later to the court and say, the property sold for $100,000. I was owed, pursuant to that judgment you issued, $200,000. The difference is $100,000. I want a personal judgment for that deficiency. The court is obligated under the law to issue a deficiency judgment unless there's something very, very unusual. And that's when your lawyer has to go into court and say, judge, a deficiency should not be issued because we had a good faith buyer at some point prior to the sale and it was for an amount in excess of what the property sold for, and then the judge will determine that, whether or not that's sufficient in order to affect the deficiency. That's a question that can't be decided in advance. That's a case-by-case -case determination. Should the deficiency issue, or should the court issue a judgment for that deficiency, that is a personal judgment against you. It'll be recorded at the state level with the Secretary of State through a certificate of lien for the judgment and on a state on the county level. Then 
whomever is proceeding on behalf of the judgment creditor will attempt to levy your accounts, collect your assets, and by the way, when a judgment is issued, there's a form attached to it which you